Welcome to Masters of Risk, the podcast where we uncover what is top of mind for business leaders today. I'm Yashi Adab, and I will be your host every month. Let's get started. I'm excited to have joining me a very special guest, Michelle Vincent, who is the CEO of MoFilm. Hi, Michelle. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Yashi. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So without further ado, I think I'd love to just get right into it. Can you give me a little bit of background on yourself, but also um, on MoFilm, the firm that you currently work for? Absolutely. So I have been at MoFilm for, it will be two years in May, uh, after a career that was really grounded in sales, a large part of that focus in the technology sector, which led itself into this creative opportunity at MoFilm uh, as a content creative agency with a global creator community from all walks of life that are powered by generative AI skill sets and expertise in pretty much every realm of creativity in front, behind, and around the camera. Uh, And we partner with brands to bring their stories to life, their branded content to life, oftentimes with an authentic touch that our creators make on a brief by brief basis. So um, it's a lot of fun. We do everything from AR, VR to billboards to TV campaigns, digital campaigns. Um, it's It's been a great journey so far. Wow, that sounds just extremely cutting edge, I think, given everything that we're hearing today about AI and how a lot of different firms are incorporating it into their day-to-day workflows and processes. And I actually hadn't thought about it as much from a creative aspect. I mean, being that we are S&P and typically sit within the financial world, it's really interesting to see how you're, you know, incorporating it um, from the creative side. So that's very, very cool to hear. Um, can you, I guess, maybe tell me a little bit about your life prior to MoFilm? So I know you said you're coming up on two years, so happy almost anniversary to you, but what, you know, who was Michelle before that kind of, what was the journey that brought you to where you are today? What was the journey? It's funny because being uh, a part of this conversation on the topic of masters of risk, If I had turned to a 25-year-old version of myself, I would have told you that I was very risk-averse. But fast forward to today, I realized uh, that much of my journey was shaped by taking a lot of calculated risks um, and actually changing directions in a way that I knew was a combination of sometimes a little bit of data, sometimes a little bit of gut. Uh, And that story really started from college. I started out as a pre-med student and I thought I was going to be a bilingual speaking doctor. I had a Spanish major on top of that as well. Um, probably an ophthalmologist, uh, still wanted to come to New York and never would I have ever (laughs) imagined, uh, that I would, uh, find myself working in, uh, media and, uh, creative. But, uh, back when I was, uh, back when I was about halfway through that journey, my gut said to me, I really enjoy learning about science and I have, had I've been gifted such incredible opportunities to be in this position right now, but this is not where my passion lies in terms of wanting to make this a career for myself. And that was a very difficult thing, not only to admit to myself, but I had I have parents that came from very humble beginnings, and they worked very hard to be in a place where they were so proud to have a daughter going to medical school. And I was, I was terrified of disappointing them. Uh, you know, there was this sort of stable future in medicine that was envisioned for me. And um, I knew that 
there was something around business. There was something around splitting my focus between marketing and finance where I knew this is where I'm going to have fun and this is where some things are going to happen. I think. <laughs> Let me go ahead and take that risk. Uh, and, and, and by doing so, uh, you know, I knew that I would juxtapose this position of, of potential happiness against that more stable and secure path. And, and that started, uh, that started uh, my journey in the career in media, uh, began at Hearst Magazines, uh, started out as a sales assistant, making copies, sending faxes. You know, it was uh, definitely a sharp pivot from where I thought I was going to be. But what was interesting at that time was being able to navigate a uh, landscape that was also evolving. So a little bit of right time, right place. I had learned that there were some opportunities cropping up at this, you know, little company called Google. And uh, it seemed like a, an interesting place to uh, explore. There was there, there were headlines about it in the news. Um, but more importantly, there was this evolution happening in digital. And so I loved the magazine world. I loved the publishing world. But another big decision was, do I jump from that and follow this thing that's really interesting, the dot-com bus, boom and bust are, are behind me. And uh, perhaps there's there's something to this little thing in tech and glad glad I went ahead and made that bet. Uh, and I know we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that journey uh, a little bit, but that was really where, um, you know, I think that that final change defined the rest of my career, uh, being a part of and leading various teams over the course of Google's evolution from 2007 to 17. Uh, working with mm -hmm. large brands that were initially trying to figure out how do I drive business outcomes by advertising on search, uh, then display. Uh, the YouTube acquisition happened during my time there. So really seeing the evolution of digital video coming into play first as just something for consumers, then later as something that became a critical part of strategies for brands. I spent some time at Meta. Uh, in that moment, it was, I was actually encouraged from a former manager at uh, Google that I had worked for to explore uh, explore the company over there. Uh, social media was really taking off in an interesting way. So that journey was also one where there were some unexpected twists and turns continuing to run some sales teams uh, and media teams across Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp was a newer priority for the company at that time. Um, so just really exciting moments to see how some of the platforms we we know and love were born. And then uh, back to Google again, uh, running uh, some different teams, building other skill sets in uh, new industries, worked on automotive as a lot of the large automotive brands were thinking through their own strategies as the industry was being disrupted by Tesla, by autonomous driving, um, really exciting, but also challenging time for automakers, uh, navigating the teams through COVID. And then uh, fast forward to, to uh, this opportunity at MoFilm today. Wow. So you've really just been around the entire tech space is what it sounds like. I mean, it's funny because the names that you brought to light Google, Facebook, which is now Meta, um, they're all leaders and pioneers of their industry. But when you were starting out there, I would almost characterize, or would you characterize them in more of a startup phase? Definitely. If not startup, maybe entering their preteen pre -teen years, <laughs> if I can say that, right? <laughs> so <laughs> yes, it, it, as, as so, I, I definitely think that they were just starting I, to grow up, and that was that was a great time and place to be inside of those companies because that's when when you're taking spaghetti, throwing everything at the wall, seeing what what sticks. Everybody's wearing a thousand hats. Eventually, that growth mindset, that mentality, has to grow up a little bit, and that was a sweet spot that I found myself inside of each organization. Actually, leaving Google for Facebook for that reason because I knew that there would be something incremental to gain as going in as a manager running teams at a company at that stage versus an individual contributor. Uh, when I joined Google in 2007, so there was a lot of opportunity to bring incremental value, but also uh, 
uh, gain it personally for my own career development in return. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Um, I, I do want to dig in a little bit more to the Facebook leg of your journey um, based on what you've shared about the time that you were there. It looks like it did overlap with um, the Cambridge Analytica era. And I'm sure when we, you know, again, being on a podcast where we are talking about risk, I'm just curious, kind of what was it like at that time? And what did you learn coming out of it in the context of um, risks that maybe you didn't even realize could be present in a business? And how did the world change moving forward? I love this question. And that particular point in time is an interesting one. As I, as I mentioned, there was something happening in the social media space. And I had been at Google 10 years at that point and uh, had I had no plans to leave. Like I said, somebody reached over the fence and said, hey, it's pretty interesting over here. And the assessment at the time to take that risk to leave was number one, making sure you leave your company <laughs> on a high note. So things were going well, leaving the team in a good place at Google uh, was very important. But also just as importantly, it was a time of change at Meta when they were starting to set different priorities for the platforms that mattered the most. When you're a tech company, especially in that FANG cohort, the expectations for year-over-year growth are high. They still remain high, but growing 15 20% year-over-year on a multi-billion dollar base is not an easy task. So often what happens are new product lines uh, get launched. I mean, I could go on with my stories at Google. I mean, anybody remember Google Plus and other things that, you know, were risks that the company took that went away? That same thing was was happening at, at Facebook before it was meta. Uh, Instagram was a platform where monetization had, was the, and the strategy for that was still in very early stages. The go-to-market that needed to be developed for teams to understand how brands could harness the power to achieve business outcomes. Again, we're still in early stages. And then interestingly, the specific industry I was working on at the time, uh, a lot of the travel uh, OTAs, that stands for online travel agencies, the, um, the aggregators that often would bring their leads to the Marriott's, the Avis's of the world, um, the solutions that would work for, let's call it a CPG brand, didn't necessarily work as well for uh, that particular segment of travel in terms of how they thought about ROI and having a more performance mindset versus branding mindset where a lot of other companies were finding success in those early days on the platform. And so uh, spending a lot of work talking to the different teams and understanding how do we think about the potential for the feedback loop from these brands to inform engineering on what could be possible to make the platform valuable for companies with all sorts of uh, priorities were really important. But eventually, uh, we encountered a moment in time that for those folks that were in the tech world, might remember as the Cambridge Analytica incident. So (laughs) not to go... uh, too far down memory lane, uh, but Cambridge Analytica was a time where there was controversy around uh, personal data, and uh, that was within the hands of Facebook, and uh, whether or not it was um, being uh, protected in the right way with other stakeholders that wanted to use that data for a number of different purposes. And quite frankly, it was so long ago that the details are are, are pretty far behind me. But The headlines were pretty damaging to the company. It raised a lot of larger questions around consumer privacy that we're still navigating through today in the wake of cookie depreciation. And a lot of tech companies have been impacted from that specific moment um, where it really opened up not only brand eyes, but it opened up consumer eyes around uh, the importance of really 
I think having more accountability in terms of how data was handled, the transparency around the handling of data and consumer choice. And what was, I think, risky at that moment, in my opinion, sat across a number of different organizations at that time. How do we take this information and talk about it with our customers? Again, big growth (laughs) goals in a year where diversification of the product solutions were the focus to offset, you know, the more stable platforms where that growth would be challenging. How do we address consumer concerns and make sure that engagement at the time, you know, growing that unique user base is still very important according in, in terms of the measures that Wall Street was using to measure the health and future potential of these businesses. So there were a lot of different elements that needed to be factored into executive decision making. But at the end of the day, the corporations that we partnered with were really going to make or break the future of being able to continue to grow as a business. And some of them raised their hands and were in the headlines and said, I'm out until you fix this. And yeah, yeah. So that was that was a challenging time. Um, what was also important to address was the morale of the team and how were we showing up for them when they yeah. were the face of Facebook uh, by themselves in the room with clients at that point in time. And it took reflecting on a similar, oh, I mean, not exactly the same, but a similar uh, challenge back at Google when YouTube was also in the headlines for some unfavorable reasons and thinking about our approach with brands. And what we found was that number one, being upfront, fast and transparent was critically important in making sure that as things were happening, as we started to understand the details behind what had gone wrong, Uh, What was the impact to that particular client? Was any of the data that uh, touched their brand and the users that were connected to their brands through the platforms impacted? We had to move really quickly and pull a lot of reports and make sure that we were uh, showing up as the trusted partners that we had always intended to be. Call us lucky, you know, my cohort of clients actually were removed from the the direct impacts. And we were able to hear from them around their biggest concerns being, you know, how the company handled uh, the situation moving forward. Um, You know, I think there was just a different time and place where there was a certain acceptable um, exchange that went on with data at that time. And there, it was just simply never challenged. So I don't know that I, I, I can't speak for whatever systems were in place or the intent that was behind it, but the importance of figuring out what was going to be important and what was best for the customers and what was best for the consumers uh, in the future was the most important thing. And to me, balancing that human trust with market education about the emerging risks and compliance with, with privacy laws as they evolved from there was uh, really critical in guiding teams through these shifts and earning back the trust of customers for the long term. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I think that's quite being able to walk away with that perspective um, is just, I'm sure, enlightening. Like hindsight's always twenty twenty, and you obviously were just kind of in the middle of it when all of that was happening. But um, I guess all of the lessons that you've learned from your time at Facebook and Google, how are you um, applying them in this journey from, you know, when I think about the transition, right? So you moved from these large tech companies to a more boutique opportunity. One, what sparked that shift? And then two, what are some of the largest lessons that you've sort of taken, you know, over that, over that line? Uh, Yes. Going from big tech to a small agency with, we, we have a creator ecosystem of 10,000 creators, but the full-time employees are only 14 people strong, including myself inside of MoFilms. That was, (laughs) that was a huge shift. That's a lean team. Oh my god. Yes. Uh, But, there were still some factors. And again, 
when I think about how we started and talking about the impact of generative AI and creativity, I mean, we set out to make sure last year we had the largest gen AI trained creator community um, uh, on the planet. And we've, we've been, we've been working to execute that. And even though there is a small company, there was always this opportunity to make a large impact through creativity. So working at these tech companies, one of the consistent things, themes that, um, that many of these teams would partner with CMOs of large global multi-divisional companies as you're trying to raise the bar on impact year over year, the creative really matters. And depending on what study that you look at, I believe one that I saw from Yahoo last year cited 80%, up to 80%. I've seen anywhere from 60 to 80% of the impact of creative assets or of assets for a marketing campaign come down to the creative. Bad creative doesn't work. (laughs) Good creative can, you know, make your brand or make, you know, whatever message you're trying to get audiences to act on to remember whatever those KPIs are can often come down to what did that creative look like? Was it sticky? Was it funny? If it makes people laugh, there's actually a much higher percentage of somebody being able to retain that content, remember the content, remember the brand that was associated with it. So the opportunity at, at MoFilm, while it was, a lot further away from what I had ever been used to really working on media planning was a great opportunity to harness the deepest level of understanding in this world of creativity that can really make or break a marketing campaign. And then fast forward again, call it my, my, (laughs) I'm reading the tea leaves in a, in a fortunate way. Um, early in my in my uh, transition, the metaverse was something that we were looking at a lot. Uh, it was something where mm-hmm. brands were experimenting, the rise of crypto and blockchain mm-hmm. internally. We knew there had to be something there, but we wanted to get our hands on it to better understand it so we could shape a POV and guide our partners on what could be possible. So again, there was no roadmap for what was about to happen with the metaverse. All we knew was that, you know what, we need to, everybody needs to create a wallet and let's get a little bit of um, cryptocurrency in there and understand this landscape, create an NFT. Uh, And so these exercises were preparing us for that. It was just that uh, that world, the metaverse world is so a little bit more, <laughs> a little bit more, a lot more complex to execute. And then with generative AI coming into a more public facing opportunity with consumers being able to get their hands on the likes of tools like chat GPT, that changed everything. And even more so for the creative industry as the likes of Dali, Mid Journey, uh, you know, so many tools and systems came to fruition that caused chaos, fear, and also excitement uh, with these brands. So even as a, 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 a and and also with the creators that 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 serve them um, in their creative uh, endeavors. And so the first thing to do was to really understand the fundamentals of what is this technology and how much of a threat is it really? What can we do as a result of this assessment? And what also don't we know where we are going to have to, um, you know, make some decisions around what do we try and what do we experiment with versus what do we perhaps put on ice because the risks are too high? And then most importantly, based on those learnings, how do we then hold hands with the clients that we work with to navigate the legal questions? There is no precedent for a lot of the things that we're doing in the creative space as it relates to the risks that one might take in putting a creative idea into a large learning model and then having that learning model be trained on your data, uh, you know, that invited the opportunity to have 
enterprise level conversations with some of these platforms and seeing what can we do to create the right protections instead of just sitting in that fear. Um, you know, a lot of learning about a lot of legal teams in the creative space often as they should in their roles, if there's a non-zero chance of any type of risk of litigation for IP infringement, uh, that's another space where the attitudes towards that almost had to soften or these companies might be at risk for being left behind and never trying any generative AI platform at all. And to me, those were all things that continue to keep me here and excited about the role and doubling down on that shift from big tech to boutique doesn't mean that the opportunities become smaller. They're just as big and just as exciting and just as much of an opportunity to navigate uncharted waters and take some really exciting risks and learning from the ones that fail in a the safest possible way to continue to grow from there and stay ahead of the curve for what's next. Yeah. I mean, that definitely to me, it sounds like you've mastered the concept of taking a risk and figuring out how to identify the opportunity within that risk. Because, you know, when you bring up your 25 year old self coming from that perspective and moving into where you are today, it's just kind of amazing to see what experience can really bring to the table. Um, so outside of outside of AI and all of, you know, your past experiences and risks that you've identified, um, are there any, what makes, I guess, the risk mitigation process kind of different or unique at MoFilm? So I'm not talking about privacy laws or things like that, but for example, diversity is a core pillar. Mm -hmm. um, of the firm that you work at, given a factor like that or any other unique characteristics, what are some different ways that you've had, or, you know, different ways you've had to, that you've had to shift your mentality and how you approach um, doing business, really? I'm glad you brought up diversity because it is a topic that is coming to the surface, especially in today's uh, political and social dynamic right now, uh, where the definition and I think the approach is being challenged in, in some unprecedented ways. And it's still a very important core value to MoFilm's business. And we believe that as some of the larger, I think, challenging conversations around diversity have that dust settle a little bit, there are still a lot of tangible benefits that are really important that we look at today. And so the data, and, it, and the proof is in the data. So companies with diverse management teams see a 19% higher revenue due to innovation which has a direct impact on financial performance, a direct impact on creative output. And that comes from bringing multiple perspectives to the table in order to come up with new ideas that an echo chamber otherwise wouldn't be able to come up with. So sometimes even taking that early step to test, what if we bring in somebody that we wouldn't bring in to have a seat at the table? Um, does that actually drive results? And so the higher level data says that it does. And if you bring that into creative production, you can also look at a lot of very tangible examples of brands that have had many foot in mouth moments because of the lack of uh, diverse perspectives in the room, even when the intent actually came from a very, very good place. Um, by not having the other perspectives in the room to raise a flag that perhaps uh, a certain community might not receive the message in the way that was intended by <laughs> the people not from the community that made it, um, that also actually can create more risk 
in that you might miss the mark and might have up in the headlines for something that you never intended to. And we could point to a number of different brands that are wonderful brands and I think have done a good job to um, come back and acknowledge where some of those challenges lie. Like, um, you know, uh, we might cite uh, Pepsi and the Kylie Jenner campaign. You know, I think you'll see in social medias and the memes about it is is that, uh, you know, a, a commercial that they ran many years ago uh, looked like um, at the time of the George Floyd uh, in, you know, um, issues that were really riling everybody up during COVID, there was a scene that looked like Kylie Jenner had handed a Pepsi to uh, riot police, and then suddenly that created peace mm-hmm. in the community. And obviously, the communities that were most sensitive to what was going on did not really connect with that, and it was not a good moment for Pepsi. So, you know, again, all of these things can be handled with grace, but those were learning moments around, hmm, Maybe if the crews that we had were more diverse, maybe if the people crafting creative concepts for this campaign uh, came from a wider breadth of experiences, that incident could have been avoided. Um, there's a number of them that uh, have, you know, circulated throughout the media community and um And, you know, again, I think many of these campaigns were done with the best intent. But the one thing that we have learned is that, uh, you know, in MoFilm's mantra, many voices are better than one because you can really come up with new ideas, but also uh, mitigate some of the uh, watch outs (laughs) that otherwise wouldn't have happened if you had the right people in the room. Yeah. No, I completely agree. And that's amazing to hear. And I love that that's something that, you know, your firm is thinking about um, and is such a driving force behind the initiatives that you guys take. So I guess all of that being said, Michelle, what are your what are your goals for MoFilm? I mean, if you guys are a 14 person shop, that's really impressive. And where, where are you looking to go? you know, in 2024 and beyond? Uh, Well, I mean, we we definitely want to continue with our bullish approach around generative AI, partnering with brands to help them uh, really map out what the integration of that technology looks like for them. Um, MoFilm is a part of the brand tech group. And one of our sister companies is called Pencil. And Pencil is a generative AI tool that can take even more detailed brand guidelines, rules of what is allowed versus not allowed in that creative and at speed and scale, create not only create different assets, but also calculate based off of industry benchmarks, the likelihood for that asset to perform. Um, So we just want to be able to equip uh, more of our partners with tools and technologies like that. It allows everybody to move better, faster, smarter. Content is not going away. Uh, It is continuing to proliferate. There's more content out there on most platforms than any of us would ever be able to consume in a lifetime if we sat down and hit play and didn't stop until the day we died. And so it becomes even more important for those that are building content to find ways to grab attention, uh, get that sort of sticky message across, and you need to move faster. You need to be able to understand the impact of that content at a higher clip and <laughs> and uh, then integrate it into your strategies with that. So So we'll continue with that from there. We'll also continue to cast authentically in front, behind, and around the camera. The uh, the best example that I love from um, some of our past work is filming for a baby formula campaign, where not only did we take the cast and make sure that we were working with real families in front of the camera. Fun fact, it is much easier to work with babies when mom and dad are the actors in front of the camera, but also behind the camera, (laughs) we cast filmmakers who were moms and interviewed for those roles with their babies on their laps. And boy, did that story look different and feel different when you had real parents creating the content story for parents. 
And those assets ended up becoming a part of the top 2% of highest performing creative content for the entire global division of Denone, who was the, the client that we were doing the, um, that creative for. So uh, we will absolutely yeah. continue to do that because it drives results. And then last but not least, um, just keep innovating, right? We don't know what's around the corner. And I think as we've seen, um, creative continues to evolve. So I can't wait to see what happens next. Yeah. Wow. That's so exciting. And I'm really excited for you and wish you the best of luck on continuing this journey. Um, but thanks again, Michelle. It was amazing having you on the podcast. Thanks for coming on to Masters of Risk. I feel like just being able to engage in this conversation outside of the typical industries and areas that I chat with and really diving into media and what's going on within the media sector and kind of all of the experiences that have culminated to what you're building today has just been absolutely fascinating. So I um, really appreciated our conversation and I'm looking forward to talking to you again sometime soon. Yashi, thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed it as well.